All right, here there, everyone. Welcome back to the lookout. I know we're not supposed to be out here in the in the cold lookout shack in the in the winter time, but um, got some action going here in California, so um, thought we'd talk about water a bit. I know um, a lot of you y'all out there know me as a fire guy um, and it's true that I've spent a lot of time working on fire stuff in the last 20 years but also um, spent a lot of time working on mapping in general in California and uh, especially on water resources um, had a lot of work you know I actually started my career off um, in fire in uh, watershed management and um, looking at the the water systems here in northeastern California, um, looking at the creeks around Chico specifically, uh, because we've got wild Chinook salmon here in some of these streams that flow through Chico and through the north uh, northeast part of the Sacramento Valley. They come up from the delta and through this whole system we're going to talk about tonight to make their way back to spawn in our local creeks here. So um, after I got done with school here in Chico, um, there was some work looking at um, the conditions of these watersheds around here. Um, and especially how the conditions were suited or not suited to the, um, the Chinook salmon. And there was a lot of interest then in, uh, making sure those salmon didn't get listed as endangered. So, um, we kind of had to learn the plumbing of the state, had some, some friends that helped me, uh, learn a lot in a short amount of time about how the plumbing works here. Uh, a guy named Eric Guinea, who's, uh, we're hoping to get on the lookout to talk about, um, flooding and water resources. He's, uh, he and I worked together 25 years ago at Chico State, and uh, he's continued to just be deep inside of um, how water and flood water and everything gets managed here in the valley. So um, the commonality between what we do on um, – oh, someone says I've got buzz audio. Um, let's get that straight starting off. Huh? Um, okay. So anyway, the commonality come between what we do on fires and what we do here with water resources is um, GIS mapping. Looking at um, using this mapping technology to understand the landscape and um, kind of get the big picture. Because just like fl um, fire, flooding is kind of one of those phenomenon that doesn't respect you know, political boundaries or you know, you know, a lot of what we got going on the... Um, on the ground, kind of what we've come, those ways we've come up with constructing our um, our towns and our uh, our flood control, control districts and our reclamation districts and everything, just like everything in California is really complicated. And so, um, just going to kind of do some of the same kind of map based tour stuff we do on fires to look at uh, kind of the plumbing here. So, um, Ryan Stevens is on here tonight. Um, Ryan's um, Lookout Ryan on Twitter. Um, he's kind of uh, my right-hand man when it comes to um, helping bring all this, uh, the mapping and the web posts and everything to you. Uh, he's doing a lot of research for us. and uh, So he's on here. He's going to be helping me as a moderator. Um, I forgot to bring up the, the notepad that he's got going for um, all your comments, but he'll moderate those. And um, we're going to jump in the maps here um, I'll take questions at the end and um, but we're kind of just going to ramble our way around uh, northern California Sacramento Valley the watersheds and um, have a look at how this it's stuff's all, all put together so don't need to look at YouTube let's look at Google Earth and uh, a little rusty here in uh, the driving the two computers thing I do have to give a shout out to our um, our kind of secret um, Secret Santa here who hooked us up with the streaming setup during uh, the mosquito fire when he saw my other my other system collapsing under the weight of all these pixels and everything else. So we're going to start off here just looking at Sacramento. And what you see here is um, the blue areas are what are kind of considered floodways. And we found some GIS data that kind of gives you the capacity of these various uh, floodways. Um, here's the yellow bypass and um, they say it can carry 500,000 cubic feet per second. 
And so as you kind of click around here on these different floodways, um, we get an idea of um, what we call kind of the design capacity. And basically that's just telling us like how much water you can pass through these kind of between the levees at a high flow without kind of overtopping. So we see like the American River, Sacramento River system, um, levee systems, 180,000 CFS. Um, dumps in the yellow bypass, it can carry 480,000 which is fed by the Sutter bypass, it can carry 216. So the game that everyone's playing um, always, any given time, any given year, is this, um, how much water can we keep in the reservoirs for irrigation and agriculture and human use uh, versus how much space do we need in the reservoirs to be able to catch floodwaters. Um, the other day we had uh, at the peak of the runoff the other day, we had, I think, uh, about 135,000 cubic feet per second coming into Folsom Dam. And um, here's Lake Folsom. So you got 135,000 coming in, and they they cranked up the releases to, I think, about um, 50,000 or something, 25,000, maybe 25,000. That was to let some water out before this storm because... With a big storm, we if we have 180,000 coming in to Folsom and no space in it, then 180,000 is going down through Sacramento where the levees can only carry 180,000. And you just have no leeway there. So um, this time of year, the um, the reservoir managers are a little less conservative. Or, you know, they can, they can keep less water in the reservoir because they're fairly sure they're going to be able to top them up. But as we get later into the spring, there's a lot of... Um, Kind of political pressure in the background to not drain down the reservoirs um, too radically because um, you you know we've we're going into you know we have such a long drought going on that a lot of the farmers that rely on water from these reservoirs have been forced to follow their fields for years and years now. So anyway, these blue areas basically are floodways and areas in the valley that we just know are going to um, have flood water in them on a regular basis not even really big flood years necessarily. They're just kind of the part of the plumbing. All right, I'm just gonna take a minute here, look at the YouTube feed and see if anyone's got any problems with anything. Sounds good, all right. Okay, so uh, let's just zoom out here and look at the whole kind of big picture of Northern California. We've got, um, just for reference here in the middle, um, we've got the Sutter Buttes. I just got to turn on my little magic mouse here. Okay. Uh, we've got the Sutter Buttes down here in the middle of the valley. We've got Sacramento. We've got Chico. And um, as we get to the north end of the valley, we've got Redding. So what I've got shaded here in these blue areas are just kind of two of the big watersheds that we talk about that are above our major reservoirs. And uh, so we start off here with the Feather River. It covers about 2 million acres. And it goes all the way from Oroville basically up to just this side of Susanville and basically the Continental Divide. Um, between the, well, not the continental divide, but th this is the Pacific um, Ocean watershed boundary, basically. The top of the Feather River, the water on the backside of that drains into the Great Basin, into the deserts. They go all the way out to, you know, Salt Lake and everything. Um, water from this side of the hill doesn't make it to the Pacific Ocean. And the same kind of thing is happening up here on the upper Sacramento River, which goes up to the Warner Mountains, um, up around Alturas. And, uh, Water on the backside of the mountains here also just goes into the Great Basin and evaporates. So, but the water that falls on the western side of this divide basically drains into the Sacramento River. So, the Sacramento River watershed is uh, it's pretty huge, um, and I'm missing a little piece of it that actually goes up into Oregon. But when you look at this blue area, this is the Upper Sacramento. Everything in this area, kind of between Mount Shasta and Alturas, and uh, halfway up to the Oregon border, kind of. You can just kind of call Mount Shasta the northern extent of the Sacramento Upper Sacramento River watershed. Once the water go, uh, water north of there drains into the Klamath, or um, out this way it drains into the Trinity River, and both of those go out to the ocean on their own. They don't they leave the valley basically. So we've got two enormous reservoirs basically that capture the water from the Upper Sac and from the Feather, and they're managed by two different entities. Um, you know, there's a book called Cal um, Cadillac Desert by, by Mark Reisner about the history of these two huge um, projects. 
basically Shasta Dam was built in the 1930s by the, um, the federal government and Lake Orville was built in the 1960s by the state government. And so the water from Shasta is controlled by federal agencies and that's the Central Valley Project, CVP. And water from the Feather River is controlled by the state, uh, by California Department of Water Resources. And so the geography of where we irrigate in California is kind of tied to the history of when water was developed. So um, there's also kind of a tie-in between um, hydropower on the Feather River and the history of how that hydropower was developed and um, the water rights that were available kind of through um, those same entities. So a lot of the water rights in this area were already, um, farmers in this area already were getting water from the Feather River um, before the dam was built. So we have a lot of rice growing here out um, around Chico, south of Chico. You can kind of see it on these images. This is all rice irrigated with Feather River water. So a lot of the water that comes out of Shasta Dam goes into the Sacramento River up here at Shasta Lake. And then it basically they use the Sacramento River as an irrigation ditch. And the water comes down through Redding, down to Red Bluff. And um, when it gets down to Red Bluff, there's a big diversion dam here. That's the um, Tehama Calusa Canal. And there's a big um, federal irrigation district, Tehama, the TCID Tehama Calusa Irrigation District. And then you get farther down, kind of close to Hamilton City, and there's a big diversion, which is the Glen Clusey Irrigation District. So both those entities, and the whole, basically the whole, um, you can't really get water from the Feather River across the Sacramento River to irrigate the, the west side of the Sac Valley. So all these folks over here, most of them get federal water. That water um, continues, the federal water from Chester Dam continues down through the Sacramento River, um, down through Sacramento and down into the Delta down here. And then it in the south end of the Delta, it is pumped into the aqueducts and the big canals that you see when you drive I-5 and taken down to the San Joaquin Valley and used to irrigate all over the San Joaquin Valley. So a ton of the water in the Central Valley project uh, coming out of Shasta Dam goes to the San Joaquin Valley. A lot of the water in the state water project goes to farmers on the east side of the Sac River, but it also goes into the California aqueduct, similarly out of the Delta, and then it goes to water users in the south, but it also goes to a lot of urban water users, you know, as far down as like Ventura and down around Santa Barbara. So 75% of the water, I think, or more in the state water project comes from the Feather River. So anyway, this is just all um, to kind of tell you a story about how we've got right off the bat two huge different players in water management in northern california we've got the state the state water project we've got the feds and then uh, we've got all these different federal or state irrigation districts um, well federal or private irrigation districts that are getting their water either from one of these main sources another thing that goes on here to complicate things and everything's complicated with the water in california is we've got the trinity river water that is in uh, Lewiston at Trinity Lake that gets diverted through the mountain to Whiskey Town. And that ends up also in our Sac Valley kind of equation. It doesn't matter for flood control because they don't divert water when we've got too much of it. But it is part of the whole equation of how water um, gets horse trade and everything else. Big issues there with that diversion in that it um, causes low water in the Trinity and in the Lower Klamath, which um, kills salmon. And so we've had huge battles between um, the Iraq tribe um, and the federal government over these uh, basically federal irrigation districts in the Central Valley getting preference for water over um, treaty rights to water for healthy salmon fisheries on the Trinity. Anyway, pretty complicated plumbing, difficult politics, and all that kind of translates into this really gnarly um, complicated patchwork of people who manage levees, canals, floodgates, water delivery. It's, um, it's pretty crazy. There's over a hundred different entities, um, in the central Valley that are responsible for maintaining all these levees. 
And so all these black lines on here are various levees on the Sacramento River system. And we're looking, we're kind of coming down here to the Sutter Buttes. So um, just another little kind of quick show and tell thing is we've got, um, we're talking about GIS data um, and the tools we use for mapping here. And the state has, um, all these different partners have done a ton of planning uh, forever, basically around water in California. And so they've, um, they've gotten better and better at sharing the data. And so we've got here like um, a bunch of publicly available GIS data from um, mainly from the State Department of Water Resources. But we look at this stuff and kind of use it to kind of tell you guys the stories we're telling. So, um, you know, and there's some interesting stuff in here, like modeling that they've done to like come up with an idea of um, what's the 500 year floodplain look like for the Central Valley. Versus the you know 200 year floodplain uh, versus the 100 year floodplain, which is a lot of stuff we've seen. Here's kind of the, the 200 year floodplain projections. And one of the things we found in here that was pretty interesting, I thought was um, historic maps of previous floods. So here's like the 1997 floods um, that were caused la largely by rain on snow events in, um, in the Sierra Nevada. And so this is, you know, Sutter Buttes here. And we see like, uh, you know, that we basically flooded the whole kind of Butte Basin and a lot of the area along the Sac River going up into Butte County, et cetera. That's just kind of normal, right? This is the bottom of this huge valley that used to be all flooded all the time or, you know, often. So um, that's 97. We had 86 storm also, um, which flooded a lot of the same area and then also some tributary areas. So the big deal with all this is when the flooding, you know, hardly anyone lives out here in the Butte Basin. People know better. It's, it's you know, been a wetland. There's a lot of duck clubs. Uh, there's wildlife refuges. Not generally a big deal for the Butte Basin to flood. But over here around uh, this, like, Plumas Lake, around Yuba City, you know, when places like that flood and we put, you know, a whole subdivision under, um, what's the problem? This has all been built um, since... 97. So the 86 flood um, stayed out of this area. But a lot of this area um, has flooded in the past. This is kind of the confluence of the Bear River and uh, where are we at here? Oh, that's Yuba City. Sorry. Anyway, so we'll jump back to talking about the bypass systems here. But um, just to say that there's a lot of information out here and um, we're kind of using it to take a look at um, how things are playing out. And um, I also wanted to show, this was the layer I was talking about, which is all the different agencies that maintain levees um, up through the Central Valley. So we got rec uh, reclamation districts, we've got uh, the state, we've got um, Army Corps of Engineers. You know, uh, down here in the Delta, it's like there's almost like a different reclamation district for every island. And the way that this reminds me of fire is just that um, you've got this big phenomenon like fire that doesn't care about geographic boundaries. And then you've got, you know, all these different agencies with fire that are dealing with fuels management, fire safety councils, state agencies, federal agencies. And so if you've got a weak spot in your fuel break, um, the fire can burn through it. And if you've got a weak spot in your levee system, uh, fire, the flood can happen also. And both fire and flood are both these kind of natural phenomenon that don't really care about our our little piddling efforts when we have a big event when we have a campfire or a dixie fire or a 97 flood you know all these little kind of um scratchings we've made here um piling up dirt they really don't uh, they don't amount to much so um just one reflection on gis data is like we've got all this data and it gives us this ability to visualize things at a landscape scale and i think sometimes it it gives us the idea that we can actually affect change or that we can somehow change the outcome of a giant atmospheric river flood or a big wind driven wildfire. Anyway, um, and also, you know, between fire and flood, it's like, yeah, firefighting works, um, uh, you know, 99% of the time, just like flood control does. But then you get that once in a, you know, once in a century event and it doesn't. So I think we're just going to start out here. Um, 
for a little um, talk about the Sac River, um, where I live in Chico, and I just did a kind of Twitter thread a couple of days ago about um, the flood control system here in Chico. Um, Big Chico Creek runs through Chico, where I live, and it starts up here um, around Butte Meadows, up about um, 7,000 feet. And so we can here have rain on snow, uh, where we might get a big storm that dumps, you know, four or five feet of snow up here at Jonesville, followed by a high elevation rain event. All that water then comes down Chico Creek here. And when it gets to Chico, um, we don't want that all to go through the park, basically, because um, this channel that goes through Chico can only handle about 1500 CFS. CFS is a cubic foot per second. So if you kind of visualize milk chugs floating by um, a gallon, there's um, seven gallons in a cubic foot about. So when that water gets here to Chico, it begins its journey um, into California's flood control system. Um, we've got a diversion dam up here at the five mile recreation area that shunts. It can only let, um, there's a gap here in the levee basically, and it lets, um, 1500 CFS go down through the park. The rest goes over here and gets dumped through another gate in the Lindo channel, which can take like 5,000, 6,000 CFS. And then the rest gets shunted into Sycamore diversion. And that goes all the way around the city of Chico and shunts all this kind of foothill runoff. Um, around the town and you see that the town has actually been planned with that in mind like the the flood control system has basically been in the uh, general plan the urban growth boundary because if you want to go and build out here basically you're prone to flooding from all these little foothill creeks so we see that a lot kind of all up and down the state is that our towns have kind of evolved with um, this infrastructure built this infrastructure is really expensive to build the state and feds generally have built it in a lot of places and then the county or the city might take over management of it but it's you know they're big public works projects that are expensive and once you've got it built oftentimes it kind of dictates our development patterns so our flood water here is um, it's going to skip around chico it's going to drop in the sac river and the sac river kind of ends out acting in a lot of ways kind of like the big storm drain for uh for everything right you got to dump this water it's the low spot and all of the urban runoff and everything else winds up in the sack and it goes down in here. And one thing that's interesting about this part of the sack where, um, you know, we're, this is kind of referred to as the Red Bluff to Calusa section of the Sack River is that there aren't a lot of levees right on the river. And a big reason for that is that, um, 1986, um, SB 1086, um, set aside a lot of money to do conservation along the Sacramento River, r recognizing that the more levees you have, the less buffer you have for floodplain for the water to kind of spread out and slow down. And so uh, millions of dollars, literally hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on planting riparian forest and restoring riparian forest on this section of the Sac River. So there's some, some uh, levees here that protect some agriculture and stuff, but some levees have been taken out and generally there's, um, the river has access to its floodplain through sections of this. We get down to the section here, and um, as we get down to Butte City, there's levees now that are on both sides of the river, but they're not pinning the river in too tight. The river can kind of still spill. And so one thing that happens here um, is there's some low spots in the levee, uh, or where there's no levee at all, where the water can just spill out here into the Butte Basin, as it always has, right? And so one reason that there's all this clay and rice growing out here is that this is just like this long-term kind of floodplain that for thousands of years has been where the Sac River has flooded out um, in high flows in the winter. And if you think of um, the soil particles being, um, you know, the coarse soil drops out as soon as the water st starts slowing down, the farther and farther you get from the river, the finer and finer the sediment in the water has to be to stay kind of suspended in the water. So by the time you get out into this clay bottoms, it's just kind of like the finest of the clay that was in the water is still able to kind of be carried by the water. So that's kind of what we call these basin clays. So as you get down farther, um, 
towards Calusa now on the still on the Sac River. We're kind of north of the Sutter Buttes here. Um, there's what are called um, some weirs, and weirs are places here where there's a low spot in the levee and it just kind of floods out into here. And that's these are designed as safety valves basically. So when we we start thinking about as we get down close to Calusa here, we're thinking about how do we keep big flood flows in the Sacramento River from concentrating and taking out Sacramento. Because we're still a long ways from Sacramento, but they're already thinking of it all the way up here. So we've got these kind of pressure relief valves on this system. And so here we see that between the levees, um, they say the Sacramento River can carry 160,000 CFS. Uh, just for reference, like when we had our big floods in 97, Butte Creek, which isn't a huge river, um, up here by Chico was carrying 40,000. Right, so this here is Butte Creek. It was carrying forty thousand. So you look at Chico Creek, was maybe carrying you know twenty five. It doesn't take long to see that like one hundred sixty thousand really isn't that much when you look at like oh man, what a huge area. We've got none of these streams here on the east side of the valley between Chico and Red Bluff have any sort of dams on them or anything. So once Shasta Dam can't hold any more runoff and you're spilling. Shasta Dam, or once Orville's full and it's spilling, um, you've got this huge amount of area that's draining down to the Sac River. So coming back down here to Calusa and these weirs that kick water out into the Butte Sink, this is kind of the lowest elevation area um, north of Calusa is this Butte Basin, Duck Clubs. and So uh, we've got Yuba City and Marysville over here. We've got Sacramento down here. And so the thinking here is, hey, We've got all this agriculture down here below Calusa. And what you see now is that once you get below Calusa, the Sac River is basically straight jacketed. Uh, it's just a canal, right? There's hardly any riparian forest. And the river itself, um, it can only carry 65,000 CFS, right? It, in 1957. And it's like operationally, they, they don't want to put more than 48,000 through here. So basically, even though this is kind of the bottom of the landscape, they've decided like, hey, you know, this is mainly agriculture. There's not a lot of towns down here, but we don't want to flood this stretch. So what they do is they kick the water out here above Calusa. They got a big gap in the levee. Calusa Weir dumps in, and then it all kind of just can flood to the north side of this levee system down into the Sutter Bypass. So we've got Highway 20 running across here, west to east, and we've got Yuba City and Marysville over here. And the Sutter Bypass is this big uh, system of two levees. Um, I'm not sure how far apart, but it can carry 180,000, 150 to 180,000 CFS. So basically, we're dumping as much water as we can out of the SAC into this flood control overflow and then keeping the SAC kind of hemmed in here. Another big thing that's happening down here is that we talked about all the Calus all the west side water districts getting their um, water from the feds all that has to drain somewhere so there's kind of like this Calusa basin main drain that comes down this whole side of the valley that dumps water um, from all the tailwater from runoff from the irrigation from the rice fields and everything else and that all comes back down into the sack down here by night's landing so what's happening here sack gets more and more kind of diminished into this just irrigation canal sad little rip rap uh, nasty ass chunk of wasteland basically um, what we got going on farther north is that the river is able to um, meander and have natural habitat and shade and it's pretty amazing riparian habitat and you get down here and it's just a freaking ditch and one of the reasons for that is that these floods uh, are a natural disturbance that keeps the whole riparian forest kind of stimulated and alive Anyway, so instead of having that, we've got this Sutter Bypass carries a bunch of water down, and then we've got the confluence here with um, the Feather River coming down, and the Feather River kind of ends up bumping up against uh, the Sutter Bypass. So when you have high flows on the Feather, they can also then get kind of shunted here into the Sutter Bypass. Below um, Feather, now it's instead of carrying 180, um, or 216 it gets kind of bigger as you go it gets wider down here you can um, carry you know something like 380,000 CFS right 
So some of the problems we've had in 97 and also um, with the Orville Dam um, spillway problem in 2017 is just that at some point when Orville is full, they've got to dump a lot of water. And if they don't dump water out of Orville, um, it goes over the spillway. But the spillway itself, not the emergency spillway, but the old spillway, it's now the new spillway. Um, that had a fixed capacity. So same with all these dams. You have to start dumping water at some point or it's going to dump for you. And 97 kind of surprised everyone with this huge rain on snow. 2017, similarly, we got in a pickle with 2017 because even though water, we had big floods, big flows coming into Orville, they didn't want to dump water down the damaged spillway because they thought it was, you know, I, they just they had a week or so where they just couldn't dump water down the spillway because it was destroyed and getting worse. And at some point, when the emergency spillway started to uh, fail, right, they they're like, "Screw it, we got to dump water down the spillway, or else we got worse problems." Anyway, so ninety seven and twenty seventeen, the amount of water that had to be dumped down um, into the Feather River is a known. It, it was more than they they knew it was more than. The feather could handle. They knew, like, hey, it's two hundred thousand capacity, but we've got to dump two hundred fifty thousand or whatever. So that's that's when we have big flooding, right? Is like when the lakes are full, and we've got to dump more water than these channels here have capacity for. So if we know that the feather can carry two hundred ten thousand, but we've got inflows to Orville that are four hundred thousand, and it's rising, you know, uh, ten feet an hour or something. At some point, the, the flood managers have to just eat it and dump the water that they know is going to cause problems downstream because the alternative is an uncontrolled release um, out of a full lake. So that's what these blue areas are, basically. They're just kind of the, the guardrails. And um, they are what they are, and you can't make more. You can't really do much about making these larger... Um, without a lot of work. So continuing down here, now that we've got the sack and the feather together, we've got a lot of water coming down. And down here at Verona, which is, here's the sack airport. We've got the old, uh, the old sack river here, irrigation canal, sad river is reunited with its, uh, its flood water. And basically, um, when the water's low, it just continues down the sack river past the airport in the sack. But when the Sutter Bypass is charging, it just charges right over the top of the Sac River into this is the Yellow Bypass, which can carry about 300,000, 350,000. And so you, you'd know the Yellow Bypass from driving it on I-80 when you leave West Sacramento and head towards Davis and you're on this kind of elevated causeway. That's the Yellow Bypass. And so Yellow Bypass is basically a way for us to shunt the floodwaters of the Sac River and the Feather um, out of this little miniature canal that... Um, is the, where we call the Sac River now. Um, and just, so the Sac River here around Sac Airport's got a capacity of about 100,000. And the Yolo Bypass here has a capacity of about 380,000. So basically that's your kind of shortcut of how you get the Sac River and Feather River to not, and the Yuba River by the time we get down here, we've got the Yuba that's coming in here and the Bear and all this land basically from I-80 all the way to Mount Shasta uh, that wants to drain, needs to drain. It's kind of, you know, the Yolo Bypass is kind of like I-5 through Old Sacramento, where if you're going north to south, one way or another, you've got to drive uh, right through downtown Sac. And we get, that's when we've got a traffic jam. Same thing, if your water that is falling anywhere between the Coast Range and um, Nevada north of Sacramento, you've got to thread that needle too to get to the Delta. And so that's it. That's the yellow bypass. And um, it kind of doesn't show exactly what's happening here, but it kind of, it ends up flooding down here into the Delta. So kind of round out a little bit of that. Um, I'm just going to jump in here to um, the Thomas Basin. I'm not really an expert on, um, on all this, except that to know that this used to, when I was a youngster uh, with rice fields and it's rice fields because 
it's the bottom. It's the floodplain. It's where it's about as low as you get without being in uh, like West Sacramento. So all this development that's happened out here has been kind of um, accompanied by a lot of levee building, and it took a lot of uh, wheeling and dealing and big money to build up levees to the point where um, it was kind of developable, but it's still the bottom. So we've got a lot of infrastructure, you know, so if you look at this having a, a ring all the way around it of levees that keep the water out, the, those levees also keep the water that's in here from getting to a river. And so then we end up needing to have pumps to pump the floodwaters from inside these levees, which are below the level of the flooding river up into the river. And so the pumps to me, they remind me a bit of, um, you know, when we talk about wildfire of, you know, like a hand line that's thrown out in front of a, a fire that's spotting two miles. And that uh, when you look at the scale of a pump running on diesel down in the bottom of tens of thousands of acres that are getting um, six inches of rain or something like that, that's why we start thinking in acre feet is that it becomes pretty crazy to try to pump all that water out. Um, here in American River, we've got the American River Parkway, which um, is not levied for um, a large portion of it, larger part. And then when you get down into the levees, uh, we talked a bit about the, ca the capacity there of that levee system. And so here we're just kind of 100% reliant on storage in Folsom and then managing that thriftily um, so you've got a buffer and that's why we end up having big flood problems on these extended multi-event kind of storms where you've got an atmospheric river and another one another one is that we just can't run down the storage in Folsom fast enough at some point to make room for the next storm that's coming one of the reasons we can't do that is because after a week after a bunch of big storms yellow bypass is full the Sac River is full, the Sutter Bypass is full, and you can't just dump more and more water down on top of that because it gets to a point where it's just adding to the elevation of the flooding down here. And so that's where the system breaks down, is when we have um, storm after storm and the reservoirs get full or we don't have opportunities between the storms to drain down the reservoirs. Anyway, um, that's some of the big picture. I'm going to take some questions. I can't take a lot just because I've got to tend to the kiddos. But um, I did want to just jump in and kind of um, talk about this big picture because I think, you know, um, there's just so much going on with all the levees and all the diversions and all the players and... Um, you know, we're definitely not meteorologists here at the lookout. Um, we're geographers. And uh, we just kind of want to help you understand the place names, uh, the lingo, the big picture concepts of basically we're trying to shunt the water out and about, uh, keep it keep it out of the cities. And for the most part, when you look at, um, sorry, when you look at 1997, um, For the most part, we've kept these floods out of the major areas, you know, out urban areas. You know, 97, there was like, yeah, it was bad, and there was flooding in some urban areas. Um, but we didn't flood out Sacramento. Um, you know, the other thing I think is interesting is just how much has been built since then. Um, all right. So I'm going to take a look here at some of the comments. Um, there's a lot. Of, I see there's a lot of questions about um, hey, there's a question from a comment from Barack Obama right on hey Barack uh, Barack Obama talking about global warming um, please take a political compass test on the live stream at some point opinions and life uh, Vicki Lewis is one of our biggest fans she's asking if the Orville spillway is functional it is um, all right um Man, uh, a lot of comments. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm going to have to 
jump. Give me a second so I can uh, let look out Ryan help me here. I'm going to bring up a different screen just so you don't have to look at my computer. Uh, nice talking to y'all. Um, what was I doing? Got to find the stuff. I'll see. Look out, Ryan. Typing furiously. YouTube Live. Is there anything in there? Can I provide information on rain on snow event and how much snow had rainfall versus what we might see soon? Good question. Um, yeah, rain on snow is kind of like one of those things. It's kind of like east wind blowing and drying out the landscape before you get a big wind driven wild north wind wildfire there's a lot of talk definitely about um changes in precipitation with climate change and if we're going to see more snow more winter precip come as rain uh, if we're going to see more of it come as snow um one of the big things that happened in 97 was just that we had a really really wet snowstorm up here in you know like we got like seven feet of snow up at Bucks Lake, south of Quincy. And uh, I just want to show in here too that this is the Feather River and kind of this green and the black is all the stuff that's burned in the last two years uh, or since 2020, which is also significant. Just we've got these major changes in um, runoff and uh, that we could have a whole episode just about that. But 97, huge snows at Bucks Lake and then it rained like 42 inches in like six days and all that snow melted and poured down into the feather river and that's why we had huge flooding on the feather river side here in 97. also you see in 97 we had a lot of flooding on this east side of the valley kind of above the levees that are supposed to usually keep water inside um, from getting out around all of hearst and uh, kind of this all down along the feather so I'm um, not going to get too deep into how climate change is going to change that because I feel like most people don't really know, you know, um, how climate change is going to change the the relative balance. But what we know is that climate change is giving us um, a lot more volatile. Daniel Swain and the other people who the, um, there's some there's academics who have gone way deeper into this, and I'm not a climate scientist, and um, just say that um, you know. Rain on snow is a problem because you've got all this stuff that's just stored up here in the mountains waiting to come down and then it turns to liquid and pours down. And it's not a new thing. You know, John Muir writes about witnessing these kind of slush slides of, you know, heavy snow in the foothills, at, you know, 3,000 feet or something. And then like three days of rain and the whole landscape just sliding, you know, back in the 18, late 1800s. Um any other questions um ha is there noise coming through my mic did you hear intentional rain sound ambiance um area south of 50 alert going out um people are asking about plumas lake plumas lake is in the bottom uh of the world and um it's had a lot of levy work done so here's um Plumas Lake is kind of this whole new town south of uh, Marysville on Highway 70. Flood in 97. Uh, the problem that they got there is just that it's um, got big levees to protect it from the feather downstream of the Yuba. But you've got also this local water that comes down and you've got the Bear River coming down. And so they have pumps. Um, but it's just one of those places that um, it's in the bottom of the world. So They've got really good levee infrastructure and they've got a lot of pumps, but you, it doesn't change the fact that it really is, you know, it's low land. And, you know, when you look at this map, there is just, there, there hasn't been a lot of development in the real bottoms, which is a good thing because, you know, it's the bottom, you know, same with West Sacramento. I was at, um, ironically, um, I was visiting the house of someone who I worked with on watershed kind of planning and um, somewhere out in here. And I just remember being at her house and looking way up at the, the levees are like 30 feet higher than her house. 
and just feeling like I was kind of an ant among elephants. You're just feeling it that you're at the bottom of the entire landscape here. You know, you're at like elevation 10 feet, right? That's kind of crazy. Um, anyhow, elevation 10 feet when the levees are like, you know, at 50 feet or something. Pretty crazy. I, just, I think I, if I lived there, I'd be thinking about like this entire, <laughs> this entire uh, quadrant of the state hanging over my head. Anyway, not to harsh on you if you live down there. I hope you hope you go good. Um, California's a bit prepared, better prepared than in 2017. Someone thinks. Um, GIS state is getting better. For a long time, um, it was really hard to get um, agencies to kind of coordinate on the data and it's getting better. Um, someone's asking if the high wind warnings are going to bring fire danger and they're not. Things are super wet and you couldn't start a fire out there right now with a flamethrower. Um, all right. Information on around snow. Okay, result of the political compass test. Um, someone's asking what site I'm using. I'm using Google Earth. Um, it's one of the things we do here on the lookout is um, we take technical tools like um, we're using a program called QGIS. We, uh, we have data from a lot of different uh, public sources. We um, manipulate it and uh, process it and we're, we're kind of deep geeks here. Um, that's what GIS is, Geographic Information Systems. I work for a company called Deer Creek Resources. That's a GIS consultancy. And um, so I've been kind of hoarding, I've been doing GIS um, for almost 30 years. So I've been hoarding data my entire career. I have this big suitcase full of GIS data. And uh, it's interesting what's out there. There's like uh, DWR on their flood fighting map website. They've got like mapping of places that they know have critical problems, levees, known levee issues. Um, and it's not that they don't want to fix them. It's just that there's thousands of miles of levee and not all of them. You know, this one that blew out down to some of this river. Um, it's just like someone's private land. It's not in a levee district. It's not in, it's not made by the county. It doesn't even show up on this map, right? We got this map. And it's one of those things that we've noticed, you know, over time is there's not really an, a single authoritative levy map data source for the entire state because it's kind of like um, no one knows where they all are. You know, like it's, um, there's so many of them. So many people have some, like, let's see, like, you know, someone pushed up some dirt, you know, like, at some point, and so they blow out, and then it's like, well, who's, who's supposed to fix this? I don't know. Like, is it the county? So the county says, well, it's not my levy. Um, and some farmer just plowed this up like a hundred years ago. It's like a farm here, and uh, they weren't thinking about climate change. You know, one thing I thought was interesting when we were uh, looking at, um, I'm lost in the computer here, uh, up here around Calusa, I think it's Calusa Weir. I got this really amazing um, hand drawn maps that. The, um, were drawn in the 1800s and they had levees on them and I threw down those maps with uh, modern day levee maps and it's like oh it's the same levee like this levee was built the first version of it was built by farmers with like mules in like 1885 or something and so um, that's kind of what we're working for so when so when people say like uh, is, are we better off in 2017 it's like well not necessarily like we still have a lot of levees that were built with mules in the 1800s and uh we still have problems that people know about that can't do anything about because of budgets or whatever else so uh, there you go someone's asking um if uh, 
we won't have a fire season um, if we get enough um, rain. Never know. Someone else is uh, asking if I'm a CO2 terrorist with my control burning. Oh, love it. Keep it up, people. Um, you know, plug real quick for the lookout. Um, cause you guys are awesome. And, um, this is the lookout. This is our website. Um, it's kind of, um, a lot of our energy goes into Twitter, but, um, our longer form stuff ends up here on the lookout. Lookout's completely supported by, um, all y'all. And we appreciate it. Um, if you like what we're doing here, if you want to support us, uh, check out the lookout. You can click on this donate tab and um, become a subscriber, which helps us out a lot um, to have kind of regular. You know, I had to buy a extension for my website yesterday to be able to put tweets in here. And I could because um, I'm getting money from you all. Um, that's regular and reliable, and I can pay bills with that to keep the lookout running. You could also buy. Um, Cool lookout hats, uh, t-shirts. You can even buy uh, axes that I forged uh, for you. And the money goes back to running lookout. Anyway, I'm um, hoping to do some interviews on here with people who know more about the details of this. Flooding. Um, if you want to, if you're, if you're an expert and feel like you want to talk to our audience, uh, I'd love to have you on lookout. Uh, we can set up a Zoom deal. Anyway, um, Check out thelookout.org. Uh, follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter, Wildland Zico. And uh, shout out to everyone. Thanks, uh, Ryan, for helping uh, make this all happen. And thanks, y'all, for supporting us. <laughs>